thank you thank you so much uh, friends you are welcome to this uh, second indian orthopedic association indian arthroplasty association uh, webinar on a very interesting topic that is the uh, total knee arthroplasty in valgus knee uh, and valgus knee as we all know is uh, more difficult to treat uh, one because it is a difficult uh, situation usually the deformities are extra articular also and another reason that we in india are not having uh, the uh, enough number of patients of geno valgus apart from some patients of rheumatoid arthritis and some cases of uh, primary osteoarthritis so we'll be discussing in this webinar uh, various uh, very interesting uh, uh, tricks uh, of how to treat it in a safe and uh, uh, reasonable way and how to make your decision so i am sure that this will be very useful discussion uh, especially for our younger colleagues who are starting the arthroplasty in difficult situations we have very good faculty which i will request dr uttam work to uh, to give the detail after the address of dr ram chadha uh, dr ram uh, will be uh, is the fourth is the incoming president of indian orthopedic association thank you dr ram for uh, joining us uh, thank you so much uh, and we'll request you now to uh, say a few words and then start the webinar thank you so much Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Association and on behalf of the President of the IOA, Dr. Atul Shrivastav, I welcome you all. Uh, it's indeed uh, uh, a coincidence that I have been here for both your webinars, the first one as well as the second, and I am actually a spine surgeon uh, now by choice. And I would have been an arthroplasty surgeon as I mentioned last time. It's just that uh, destiny led me elsewhere, and. Uh, as i said i can make unhappy people and un less unhappy uh, doing spine surgery unlike you guys who can make very unhappy people very happy so i am so happy that you guys are all together and you are talking about the valgus knee for me in my training days the valgus knee was only rheumatoid arthritis we didn't know of anything else and we looked at it as the rare situation uncommon because most of the times we saw these short statured women coming into our opds obese with bilateral genu varam and very rarely did we see uh, do we see anything in valgus so i appreciate the effort you are putting in in education and training and it's a joint venture of the indian arthroplasty association and the ioa and i welcome you all i appreciate the efforts put in by the arthroplasty chair of the ioa which is uh, dr rajiv sharma as well as the support coming in from the iaa leadership which includes dr ronan roy and dr uh, rajkumar nateshan and we have dr uttam garg who's here as a webinar convener today you have an excellent faculty and i know most of them there are very dear friends of mine who are all here and uh, i appreciate that all of you are putting in your time despite the fact that there's a very interesting cricket match that's going to happen very shortly so all the best have a great time and let's educate each other thank you very much for having me god bless you yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dan. Thank, thank you so much for your good words. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chadha. Uh, so, can I uh, share my screen for just introduction? Yeah, sure, sure, Uttam. M make it uh, fast and crisp. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, yes sir. We can see. Yeah, so uh, myself so Uttam Garg from Lucknow, and I will be the coordinator of this uh, webinar. So Uttam, make it, may, bring it to slideshow, please. Make it full screen, please. Uttam. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So uh, where were my our faculty or Dr. Jain uh, Bad, but unfortunately he is not with us due to his personal reason. so we will missing in this webinar uh another faculty we have dr rajesh sharma he is a chairman of uh, moolchand medicity and he is arthroplasty chairman of indian arthroplasty association as well as in arthroplasty uh, in uh, ioa another faculty we have dr manoj vadwa he is a light orthopedic institute chairman in paras hospital recently recognized by world bank a world book of uh, record by performing 3878 joint placement in a year the very good congratulations sir thank you 
uh, another another faculty we have dr uh, dhansekhan raja he is a consultant joint placement surgeon from ganga hospital kometur he has a many uh, fellowship awards in the, within australia as well in singapore another faculty we have dr abhay alens from jodhpur in rajasthan he is a well uh, known uh, figure in adult reconstruction arthroplasty fellow in germany another speakers we have in the case presented dr mindal from delhi from amrita institute of medicity faridabad sorry another faculty we have dr nirmal jadodia uh, from the durgapur west bengal he has also done his ranavat fellowship another faculty we have dr rajiv verma from manipal hospital new delhi we have discussion panelist of dr mohanthi from mumbai dr lakesh rajput from kolkata dr vijay kumar from new delhi dr subhas from delhi dr avtar singh kambos from amritsar dr sanjeev gupta from jambau and dr anil vora from new delhi so all of the faculty most welcome sir see you in this further discussion right sir so i request now further for my first speaker dr abhay alens sir you will have to unshare your screen yeah i am doing now dr abhay alens i am just inviting you for the classification of valgus knee and its implications so can you see my screen sir uh, yes sir we can see okay yes can see yeah. All right. So, good evening, and thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv and the Indian Orthopedic Association, for the invite. My brief today is to speak on the valgus knee, the classic classifications, and what clinical relevance we have from being able to classify these knees. So essentially, the a tibiofemoral angle of more than ten degrees qualifies as a valgus. About ten percent of the total knees that we do will be valgus. So it's not a very common entity when it compares to the quantum of uh, total knees that we do. And uh, overall, world literature essentially speaks of three basic common reasons why uh, the valgus knee is more difficult than the varus one. One, because the surgeons are less familiar, and there's a paucity of soft tissue laterally as compared to that medially. The second is the higher risk of common peroneal nerve palsy, especially the ones with the flexion valgus. There are osseous defects in the lateral femoral condyle as well as in the posterolateral femur and the tibia. And an increased Q angle essentially uh, manifests as an external rotation deformity of the distal femur and proximal tibia, and sometimes because of uh, chronic remodeling changes, which also causes trochlear. erosions and lateral subluxations of the patella so the anatomy of, of the soft tissue that has gone haywire essentially means that there is a tightness of the lateral soft tissue sleeve and an attenuation and a laxity of the medial soft tissue sleeve and essentially what we are looking at in balancing is that the lateral co- collateral ligament and the popliteus will be tight in flexion and extension the it band and the posterolateral capsules will be tight only in pec like extension and the popliteal fibular ligament is tight only in flexion so depending upon the kind of deformity we have one has to look at uh, basically uh, releasing or stretching out these particular ligaments on the osseous side essentially there is an asymmetric wear on and hypoplasia of the posterior condyle of the femur as well as the posterolateral condyle of the femur and the tibia there may be a, a erosion of the trochlear groove and an asymmetric wear causing maltracking of the patella and there'll be external tibial torsion and increased tightness of the uh, lateral retinaculum which is enhanced and exaggerated by the chronic uh, valgus remodeling of the distal femur and the tibia and even in extra articular deformities the pathognomy essentially is complicated more by the presence of sagittal plane deformities which means that there could be a, a valgus a flexion valgus or a hyperextension valgus and sometimes these multiplanar deformities have problems associated in the foot wherein there will be hind foot deformities with uh, with or without subtalar subluxation as well as distortion of the midfoot complex and the basically what this does to a 
to a valgus corrected knee is that post total knee arthroplasty sometimes uh, these patients with foot deformities will have residual uh, lateralization of the mechanical axis uh, more than where it belongs and then there will be met metaphyseal valgus remodeling of the femur and tibia uh, uh, because of the chronicity of the problem so if one comes to classify uh, the valgus knees essentially ranavat uh, classifies them based on three important things first is based on the degree of deformity the status of the medial collateral ligament and the amount of lateral release that is required so the type 1 is a minimal deformity where there would be a minimal stretching of the medial soft tissue sleeve type 2 has a substantial deformity of more than 10 degrees and less than 20 degrees these are knees which are associated with bone loss and with stretching and attenuation of the medial collateral ligament and type 3 is are the ones where there is a severe deformity there will be associated osseous deficiency and an incompetent uh, or a, or a partially competent uh, medial collateral ligament mulaji and shetty uh, our own dr mulaji has uh, modified this classification and now they have described six types basically on the severity and the correctability of valgus association of sagittal planes and extra articular deformities and the status of the medial collateral ligament so a type 1 according to dr mulaji and dr shetty is a correctable valgus where there is no associated deformity and there would be a medial collateral ligament which is functioning fully well a type 2 is a rigid valgus with no associated deformity with a medial collateral ligament which is intact type 3 and type 4 have the association of sagittal plane deformities where type 3 is associated with a hyperextension deformity and type 4 is associated with a flexion deformity type 5 is where the deformity is so severe the valgus is so severe and it is associated with uh, incompetence of the uh, medial collateral ligament and which is where we start thinking and talking about building in constraint into a total knee arthroplasty implant and type 6 is a valgus with an extra articular deformity and what an extra articular deformity does is that it exaggerates the q angle and it causes a secondary contracture of the lateral retinaculum and the lateral soft tissue sleeve so here is a 55 year old lady who has a correctable valgus uh, on the left side on 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 both sides this lady went in for standard uh, a standard total knee arthroplasty and with standard releases which were very minimal uh, and we were able to get a very good uh, a balance total knee onto this lady type 2s where you would have uh, a rigid valgus and these are patients essentially where uh, you would require an anteromedial approach you would require to factor in the valgus correction angle and dr mulaji has published on this that there is an inverse association of the valgus correction angle with the severity of the valgus and uh, in the knee and one would need to reduce the marginal osteophytes so pcl may or may not be reduced if you have a stable balanced pcl it is not a must to remove and the posterolateral capsule or the posterior capsule would need some release or some uh, by thrusting to get in a balanced uh, extension gap on which to build us a, a flexion gap so this patient had a, a cr knee and eventually did very well type 3 knees are those where one builds in uh, a sagittal plane deformity along with a coronal plane deformity and this was a patient who had uh, a valgus hyperextension knee uh, wherein we went in and had to build in uh, a constraint into her total knee implant and she required uh, Uh, her PCL as well to be taken off. Obviously, if we are going to be using a constraint in this case, the next type of valgus is a flexion valgus. These are the most common types. These are the ones which are most commonly associated with the uh, common peroneal nerve injury, and uh, this is where one would really need to to balance out the extension space and then make it rectangular before one can balance the flexion space to the extension space. So this patient. had the standard anteromedial approach had the varus correction angle valgus correction angle factored into the uh, distal femur jig 
had the releases, the standard releases, and in addition to those who needed an IT band by trusting and a PS implant and got a stable well-balanced knee. The type 5 valguses are the severe ones, and this one had a bilateral hip along with all the changes and a very stiff and rigid uh, valgus on both the flexion valgus on both the sides with very minimal range of motion. This patient had undergone a bilateral total hip arthroplasty three to six weeks earlier, and then we were able to do, we, were, we had to do a constrained uh, total knee arthroplasty for him. What we also needed to do was to do a prophylactic fixation with the DFLP just to prevent an interprosthetic fracture uh, because there was a very narrow zone of transition between the Wagner stem and the stem of uh, the total knee implant. And then you would have the type 6 extra-articular deformities wherein uh, there is a secondary additional contracture of the lateral sleeve and the lateral peroneal retinaculum and which would require an appropriate implant and these do extremely well. So the valgus total knee, essentially the implant choice will vary from the degree of valgus and the degree of instability or instability of the medial collateral ligament. The soft tissue releases is a plethora. It is a complex thing. Everybody has their own go-to method or manual. But by and large, what works mostly, and one has seen what has uh, been advocated by Elkis and, and Ranavat is the inside-out technique which has shown 100% survivorship at 10 years and 83% survivorship at 15 years. And this means balance the extension space after the distal femur and the proximal tibial cut, remove marginal osteophytes, release PCL, do the posterior capsule and posterolateral capsule release. If it is further tight and extension, balance it further with IT band pipe thrusting to maintain continuity of the IT band. Popliteus may or may not require to be released. And once the extension space is, tri is rectangular, uh, then balance the flexion space and take your posterior conda femur cut and have a nice balanced total knee arthroplasty. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Abhay. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, explanation of the classification of various very difficult types. Uh, Uttam, I think uh, we can take up the discussion after the four talks. Okay, fine. No problem. To, to save the time, uh, yeah, can yeah. you invite, invite the next speaker, please? Okay. So, next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nirmal, are you ready? Uh, Dr. Dhan Shikar Raja. Raja, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Dr. Dhan Shikar Raja. Uh, are you ready, sir? I am ready. I am just. Yeah, he will talk on the balancing of the uh, TKR by the parapetal approach, lateral parapetal approach. Is it? Just a second, I'll share my screen. The next we will have a Dr. Manuj. Uh, Dana, is it okay we take up Dr. Manuj's talk and then after your talk? Uh, just a second because uh, I need to, I'm traveling on the way to Coimbatore. Right. Okay, okay. Sure. So and then uh, continue my travel. Okay, fine. fine. Sorry for the delay. Suddenly, I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, I checked it before. Yeah. Yeah. Can you switch off your video and then try? Maybe the connection will be better. Okay. What is the problem? Is there an internet problem? 
No, suddenly it's not coming up. Maybe you start the next lecture. I'll, uh, I, I, I'll I think so. We, we invite uh, Dr. Manoj Vadwa uh, to speak on his uh, uh, on his uh, soft tissue release in a difficult valgus knee. Manoj, can you please share your slides? My screen is also not coming. Is something wrong? Hmm. This, this this is like, yeah. Somebody so. has sabotaged. us. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I think this may be because they, we are also uh, live streaming on Ortho TV uh, and uh, uh, IOA TV also. Maybe some soft tissue glitch in this. Manu, you are not able to take up your, your screen? I again, story is coming my, in my share screen. Uh, uh, Nirmal, uh, can you unshare your screen? I think that may be the reason. No, I can get in there. Yeah, I can get it now. Yeah. Can you see my screen, Ajit? We can see now. Yeah. So, I shall be thinking about soft tissue corrections in a valgus knee. The first thing to start from is uh, the basic point to understand. A valgus is not a mirror image of a various knee. And there are certain protocols. Very, very simple. Yeah, I don't know the so, you have to first analyze whether the bone loss is there or the soft tissue deformity is there. Majority of these cases have this kind of plano valgoid foots. So, the foot and ankle guys would say, see these a lot and they are kind of implant they're going to use through. So, we have to first see if there is a stiff valgus or is a flexible correctable valgus. Because that dictates a lot whether you teach with the bone loss is an issue or a soft tissue is an issue. Once you do an exposure, which is the midline, you have a choice of going in the lateral parapetal, which Anashikar will show it to you. I will be focusing on the medial parapetal, which is my workhorse. The only cases where a Tika lateral parapetal is where I have a sublux dislocated patella. Otherwise, majority of these knees I handle through the valgus approach only. So the certain, I think, carry on messages for young arthroplasty surgeons. You should always medialize your intermedial rods for a non-robotic or a non-navigated surgery. I always keep a three degrees of valgus because I do not want to end up with a hypocorrection of my deformity. So whenever you cut this, you will have a differential cut. You will have a far lesser a lateral condyle because you have a hypoplastic distal as well as posterior lateral condyle or femur. So your tibial alignment goes the same way with the medial to mid third of the tibial tibrosity. Be very particular about your tibial cut and rotation. So. Slope is an important part. I am a CR surgeon and for all these deformities, I normally do a CR knee. All of these knees which are tight in valgus, you have to do a pie crusting of the capsule as well as the IT band. Never cut the popliteus or the LCL. Rotation, a very important part. Just do not take the posterior condylar axis as a benchmark. Here you have to see about the tibial rotation, the white side lines and mainly the trans epicondylar axis. Your tibial cut and trans epicondylar lines have to be in the paralloid. So once you make these cuts, you size up your tibia, you see your tracking. So normally for majority of the grade 1, 10 degree, 20, this kind of deformity, you just spike rusting helps you out with a very stable knee with rectangular flexion extension gaps. Check your stability in mid flexion, full flexion and extension and going on to the patella tracking also. This is full seating of the patella lying into the sulcus, full bending and for majority of these valgoid knees, this situation works. You might have situations where you have very tight lateral structures, spike rusting of IT band and posterior capsule. Use a laminar spreader, identify the tight bands. Still, you will find many times that you have a medial laxity. So tightening of MCL is a tougher part. So the better part is go back in and do release with 11 gauge needle, your posterior capsule and the IT band tightness. Once you do these structures, you will have a rectangular flexion gap, well balanced knee inflection and extension. A third case where you have these valgus with FFT. So these are the stiff knees, which are a bit out of a tougher situation. You have leno valgoid foot. And in these cases, if you see the kind of deformities are grotesque, they would order around 40 degrees of a valgus deformity. FFD gets a lot connected with uh, anesthesia, but if you see the deformity, it's huge. There is also stretching of the MCL. So here I do a very selective medial release just up to the mid corner plane. Don't go to the posterior lateral corner or posterior medial corner. Do a selective medial release, subluxus patella, 
take out the osteophytes and decompression of the posterolateral gutter is extremely important take off all these osteophytes and all bony pressures that are there the same rules medialize intramedullary alignment guide by 5 to 10 mm with a differential pitch drill and you will always find a hypoplastic distal lateral condyle you will hardly have any section of the lateral side your distal femoral section in 3 degrees of valgus you normally have a very tight patel of moral ligament so release the patel of moral ligament and as to spoken before your rotation of the femur is not with the posterior condylar axis but with the transapical condylar axis and tibial cut so you will have a parallax effect the another marker to check on your tibial rotation is a uh, femoral rotation is you see a grand canal sign on the top again you have a very hypoplastic posterolateral condyle as compared to the postero medial when you go back you realize that still you have a lot of flexity on the medial side so you have to release the tightness on the lateral side once that is released take off the osteophytes tending the lateral collateral ligament these osteophytes are taken off you have to still go back in and see the rectangular flexion extension gaps if you still have laxities you will still have to release on the lateral side so tightening of mcl is a very uh, problematic situation so releasing the lateral side is a way better answer across in these situations and i normally do not like adding up the constraints as majority of these knees are the cr knees only another problem is the tracking still you site very tight lateral structures and your patella is somewhat saving laterally so i prefer outside in release saving the geniculars release the tight lateral structures and gradually we'll see your patella will start fitting into the femoral sulcus on flexion the patella is sitting very well you have full flexion achieved still one component is left that is external rotation of the tibia because of the tight it band so it band release is done you identify the tight it band structures release the it band and now what you have to aim for is balance flexion extension gaps well sitting patella into the femoral sulcus and correction of tibial rotation by a release of the it band once all these things are done you have a well aligned knee and the patient's walking the same day so the basic parameter is in all these things the soft tissue correction would give you majority of the deformity corrections uh, dr bryard we are missing up because he likes a lot of those lateral condylar osteotomies i can keep it as a very strong backup and uh, similarly what my dear friend dhanshikar is going to show to you on the lateral uh, uh, approach i use it only in cases where i have already dislocated or subluxated lateral patella otherwise all these parameters are done by a medial parapatellar approach and almost in 99% of the cases with a cr knee with this uh, any questions i'll be more than happy to answer thank you manoj that's a very uh, more detailed uh, discussion uh, and we'll be we'll be discussing your subject in the during the discussion time uh dana uh, are you able to come uh, to get your slides yeah yeah i'm there yeah yeah please start yeah thank you so much uh thank you dr rajiv uh, uh good evening dr ram uh or uh, two ia pras pras presidents rajiv and uh, suprant so mohanty uh, all the faculty i'm going to talk about a lateral approach to valgus knee so indication now almost all my valgus knee has started using this uh, lateral approach because it's more convenient and once you start doing a particular technique you are able to do a better job with the uh, own particular technique so otherwise generally i use uh, a lateral approach we have a surgical valgus more than 10 degrees that we will uh, discuss uh, and uh, patients with uh, um lateral subluxation or lateral mall tracking of the patella so ranavat classification we just now uh, discussed um type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 is a correctable deformity type 2 is a fixed deformities with attenuation of medial soft tissues these are the uh, knees which are amenable for uh, uh, lateral approach and the type 3 deformities generally we uh, when the mcl is uh, incompetent we use a a uh, standard medial approach with the with a hinge type of uh, joint tanshekar uh, we are not able to listen to you neither the slides are moving okay uh, i am able to listen him huh? yeah. 
He is audible and visible also. Yeah, his slides he are moving and we can hear him. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Then we can hear you. Rajiv, keep... there might be something with your net. Okay, so I'll go ahead with this. So, yeah, yeah, uh, please. What do we call a surgical valgus? Generally, if you do a valgus and virus stress, on a weight-bearing X-ray, there is a lot of val valgus. But most of, most of the time, the deformity is partially correctable. But if the deformity is more than 10 degrees... Tanshekar, we are not able to listen to you. Uh, Rajiv, uh, actually, I am able to listen him. Sir, he is very he is clearly audible. I yeah. guess something with your network. I will go ahead. And uh, this surgical valgus is what we need to surgically correct. The partial uh, correctable deformity we need not address through a lateral approach. If the rigid deformity which needs to be surgically addressed, then we prefer to use a lateral uh, parapetular orthotomy. So, this is an example where you have a valgus of 25 degrees on a weight bearing or a valgus oh, right. flex X-ray, but it corrects to uh, less than 10 degrees of a uh, surgical valgus. So, this need not be uh, open through a lateral approach. So, this is a video. So, this is one more example on the image on the left shows a fully correctable deformity. The right side is a rigid deformity. So, the example of one more patient of a severe valgus. The valgus is partially correctable, but it has patient has more than 10 degrees of fixed valgus, which need to be surgically corrected. So, in that uh, cases, lateral approach help you helps you to directly address the tightened lateral structures which are the IT band and the lateral capsule. So, this patient, you can see the valgus is only partially correctable. So, 15 degrees of residual valgus is there. We need to correct at least 10 degrees so that your hip knee mechanical axis is neutral or a tibiofemoral angle is in 5 degree valgus. So, the stress examination and anesthesia. So, we use a midline skin incision. Expose the lateral retinoculum up to the tibial tubercle. So you open the lateral retinoculum. When you come to the level of the petula, you need to take the entire fat pad with the lateral flap. So you change your blade horizontal, lift the entire fat pad, you can see, which will help you to expand the tissues for uh, closure. As we continue the exposure, the Insertion of IT band into the Jardis tubercle will be released as a part of the exposure. Now we are releasing the IT band from the Jardis tubercle. We preserve the entire fat pad with the lateral flap for closure. Because in valgus knee, the lateral retinoculum is contracted. So when you are closing, there is always a tight uh, a lateral closure. So once you do the exposure, we check how much of the deformity is corrected. Uh, subluxing the petula medially is going to be difficult. Sometimes uh, you may need to do a rectus snip so that you can dislocate the petula medially. So, we use a valgus correction angle measured from the preoperative x ray, do the standard distal femoral cut, and then doing the tibial cut is a bit tricky because you are approaching from the lateral side. Always mark the center of the tibial plateau, and then you use the extra medullary jig. You need to account for the extra deformity also, which is present in some cases. So, we do a minimal resection from the uh, medial plateau. So, now we check the extension gap. So, laterally is just going in, medially it's opening up. So, you can see the valgus stress, medially it's opening. Now, you do the postolateral capsule release, which is, uh, we keep rotating the tibia internally and then expose the postolateral corner. And then you check the gaps again. If you're happy with the gaps, then you go ahead and finish your uh, uh, further sizing and uh, component rotation. But if still, if it is tight, you measure the gap. If it is more than 5 millimeters difference between the medial and lateral side, it cannot be corrected with just soft tissue release because the only tight structure laterally is the uh, lateral collateral ligament and the popliteus. So now we mark the, uh, now we measure that there is more than 5 millimeters difference between the medial and lateral gap. So now we are using the trans epicondylar axis for rotation because the posterior condyle is hypoplastic. So always the condyles are internal rotated. We, you need to use more external rotation to get your tibial cut parallel to the femoral cut parallel to the tibial cut or to restore the proper rotation. So I am changing the rotation manually. 
so that it will match the transepicondylar axis. And use this block and runaway block to check the uh, gaps so that both the gaps are equal in flexion and extension. So it is 5 mm more on the middle side, both in flexion and extension. We complete the cuts, remove the posterior osteophytes, and I always use a PS knee, so it's a notch cut. Again, you can see medially the gap is more. The knee is opening up more medially, laterally is tight. So at this stage, we have released the IT band laterally and the uh, postal lateral capsule completely. So only tight structure is lateral collateral ligament. So if you cannot uh, lengthen the lateral collateral ligament, so I am opting for a lateral epigonular osteotomy. So the distal part of the bone, which is beyond the attachment of the lateral collateral, will be removed and the fragment will be slided down. So that will lengthen the lateral collateral ligament with the popliteus attachment. We can also posteriorize if the flexion is tight. So now we allow the osteotomy fragment to slide down. So you can see how it slides down and the distal portion which is uh, overhanging has to be removed so that the uh, osteotomy fragment will be fixed inside the uh, femoral component. So you provisionally fix with the screw and then do the balancing. You mark the tibial rotation. It's very important when you're using a lateral approach because your rotation, you might tend to external rotate the femoral component. So you need to keep the rotation correctly. This is how it is done. Then you can see how the uh, joint is well balanced. Petla tracking is very good. For a type 3 laterally sublex petla, the automatically this approach forms a lateral retinacular release and helps in petla tracking. So you can easily close the muscle proximally. But as, once you come distally, the closure is going to be difficult. Here we use the fat pad to close the uh, distal part of the arthrotomy and it is very waterproof also. Then check the final tracking, the post-operative x-ray, alignment x-ray, uh, comparing pre-operative walking video to the post-operative uh, walking. Patient is around 75 years, retired person, uh, likes to cycle and uh, walk. And the deformity is completely corrected with the lateral approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan Shekhar. Thank you, Shan, now, uh, Rajiv, are you able to now? Yes, yes. I yeah, yeah, okay. So now I Please. request Rajiv uh, to share his screen. He will be uh, talking. Uh, uh, am, am I visible? Yeah, visible, but not in sliding uh, mode. So you need to click on the first slide and go to slide share. Slide share. Can you see me now? Sir, your, your slides are visible on a slide sort of view. You need okay. to go on slide show. Uh, is it okay now? Uh, are we able to yes. see? Yes, yes. you can see. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Uttam. Uh, and uh, uh, my apologies that today there has been a lot of issues in the uh, in the communication. Uh, I think it is uh, because we are beaming today's webinar. Uh, through Facebook, uh, YouTube of the IAA, as well as through the Ortho TV and IU and IOA TV. So uh, uh, my apologies. I'm sure that next time it will be better. Uh, so I'll be speaking with them on the uh, the uh, severe deformities. How we can work it up by the bony procedures. How to handle the extra articular deformities, which are not uncommon in these situations, or the uh, the constrained implants, where you should use the constrained implants. So understanding the valgus knee is very important and steps for correction as we have seen in the talks of Manoj and Dr. Dhanshekar Raja. Uh, we have already discussed about the types of the genu valgum by Abhay. I will not go through it. The main issue that I will be, I'll be discussing are the components of the deformity. 
intraarticular it could be because of the wear of the cartilage and collateral frame contractions and stretching of the convex side or the deformity is extraarticular which could be the femur valgum or could be the tibia valgum that is what is to be seen and that's that's how the one of the very important thing is the lateral view of the uh, knee when you see the hypoplastic uh, femoral condyles you will see that both the condyles will superimpose on each other and they'll be looking of the same size that means that lateral uh, lateral condyle is actually hypoplastic which is not a uncommon situation in these these cases the wear uh, that is there Uh, the answer is posterolateral soft tissue release that you saw in the videos and explanations of Anshikhar, uh, plus the unconstrained knee implant, as uh, seen in the previous talks. If there is a contracture of the concave tissues, uh, lateral, posterolateral, or posterior structures, the retraction is due to the inflammatory process adjacent to the worn joint surfaces. The plus patient may have a fixed valgus or fixed flexion deformities. and the external rotation deformities answer is extensive posterolateral soft tissue release but also you have to be ready with the semi constrained implant which is a very important thing or you may opt for adequate lateral soft tissue release lateral epicondylar osteotomy that that you just saw plus the semi constrained implants if you have a elongation of the convex soft tissue mostly occurring with the flexion deformity it may be with the acl rupture or the stretched mcl the answer is very clearly extensive release and fully constrained knee implant like a rotating hinge because these are the cases which may be totally unstable on the medial side because of the absence or the over stretched medial collateral ligament and lastly comes the extra articular deformities which have to be corrected as with the intra articular correction and constrained implant or you can have the metaphyseal osteotomy or the diaphyseal osteotomy as the case may be now posterolateral soft tissue release posterolateral corner you have already seen that how how, how these these structures are are released or they need to be released the iliotibial band manoj has explained very well that the iliotibial band has to be released which is a very very important thing in these these cases which approach to be taken usually people take anteromedial approach lateral approach only in the cases where the where you have a a uh, fixed genu valgum or you have to do a tibial to buckle osteotomy these are the cases in my uh, cases which are important to be taken up with the lateral approach if the lcl release is done preserve the popliteus that is a very important thing the release of the popliteo fibular ligament if you have to release do not release the popliteus but the popliteo fibular ligament if you can identify and release it it helps a lot total meniscectomy for the vision free the popliteo fibular ligament laminar spreader in extension and palpate underneath the popliteus tendon then you can you will be able to see that that is the lateral direct lateral release posterolateral release that you can do with with a, with a very easy way but remember that the artery is very close about a centimeter away one has to be very careful and be careful that not to over release the lateral collateral ligament because it may create instability in flexion especially if you excise the postoperative ligament and it requires definitely a constrained knee implant some cases as you see that this this patient is having a fixed genu valgum on both the sides operated uh, long back in 2006 we used probably the the ps uh, uh, the pf this probably was the rpf joint uh, with the use of the navigation we can see that the correction is good just by the posterolateral soft tissue release you see that how much of the ecchymosis is there that means there has been a lot of soft tissue release in this case and that's what you see the function and this patient's function at a follow up of 2 years where you have a contracture of the concave soft tissues lateral posterolateral or posterior structures as we discussed the answer is extensive posterolateral soft tissue release and semi constrained knee implant or with a lateral epicondylar osteotomy the example is this patient with a, a proximal tibial fracture 
the the uh, patella is subluxating laterally it's a very bad stiff knee significant valgus now in this kind of a case probably it is it is very wise to be prepared with a constrained knee implant as in this case and then you will have a good function in this patient other patient having the very severe valgus deformity again a fixed valgus that's what you we see here we see the better to choose a fixed bearing joint than a mobile bearing joint because that will be a far more better approach metaphyseal osteotomy appropriate in younger patients to bring the femur and tibia in neutral for example this patient who has a significant valgus and valgus is mostly in the femur and we see that the uh, uh, lateral epicondylar osteotomy is done and the lateral epicondyle is pushed uh, distally as dan dan shekar has explained and then fixed with the screws initially you may fix it up with the uh, with the k wires corrective osteotomy where and when at the site of malunion is the ideal thing see this patient having the significant valgus what we see and sure that you have a for first you have a distal cut, femoral cut tibial cut and then see that you are not able to uh, correct it well then go for a uh, lateral epicondylar osteotomy when you do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy make sure that this is at least 1.5 cm thick so that it is it is a fixed uh, it's, a, it's a strong chunk of the bone and then shift it distally as as is seen here in the indus and the remove the distal part of the uh, of the uh, lateral epicondyle hold it with a with a hook maybe fix it with the k wires and then after you can use the fixation with the uh, with the screws and that's what you see this patient having a good function the tibial osteotomy this is the hyper corrected uh, high tibial osteotomy what you see here this patient is is uh, having the uh, significant valgus and in this patient uh, the if if we see that if we go for the normal tibial and femoral cuts what you will you will end up is having a large amount of gap medially so which will be very very unstable joint so in this kind of case either you choose for epicondylar osteotomy or you choose for the tibial osteotomy which is a better better method you cut the tibia whether with the navigation or with the instruments and then after i my trick is that i make sure that the femur is cut parallel to the tibial tibial cut rather the tibia is cut parallel to the ap cut of the femur and then after you when you have made the all the cuts you can have a fix you can assess that what is the level of the osteotomy and in that time time you do the osteotomy uh, keep it incomplete complete ensure that the periosteum is intact on the other side you can hold it with the with the help of a uh, of a staple temporarily and then use the you may use the normal pfc sigma kind of implant and you will have normally have a very good result what's what's what you see here in this patient important pointers are look at the opposite leg which will tell you uh, what is the best alignment and also always remember that under and over corrected genu valgum have to be avoided slight under correction will reduce the need for the release often limited to the arcuate ligament and better stability and better function and lastly uh, i'll request all the uh, listeners viewers Uh, to become the members of the Indian Arthroplasty Association and join us for a better education. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv, for such a wonderful presentation. So now I think discussion. Yes, any... uh, I, I think that we have a ten-minute discussion on this subject, and then we take up the cases one by one. And the first case will be of Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv Varma. I'll request okay. him to be ready with his slides. Um, uh, Danshikar, you showed a wonderful case of the epicondylar osteotomy. Are you there, Danshikar? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I'm okay. Here. Right. So, so, would you like to fix it up? Uh, the one uh, one thing that I want to make clear for younger colleagues is that would you like to temporarily fix it up with the K wires, or would you like to fix it up with the uh, with the screw fixation right in the at the time of the trial implantation? Uh, what i mean to ask you is that would you finally fix the epicondyle uh, after the final implantation 
or at the time of the trial uh, uh, implantation. Uh, I will temporarily fix it with a screw, sir, or a K wire, whichever is uh, uh, practical, because the bone, if it is very strong, sclerosis, then you can put a screw. If osteoporotic, we can put a couple of uh, K wires and then decide where you are going to finally fix the fragment so that you can uh, have an idea about your final insert and everything. Temporarily fix it, then you do a final fixation after you cement it. So, a final fixation is done after cementing. And then you choose your final insert size. That is a very good take home point that the final fixation of the epigondal or the osteotomized segment should be done after the cementing the final implant so that you can fine tune the uh, the stable stability of the knee. Thank you so much, Dana. Uh, uh, yes, Uttam, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I ask one question to Dr. Uh, Danshakar? Please. please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When you deciding a osteotomy, so wh what is your take regarding if you are uh, doing an osteotomy of lateral condyle or if you are doing an osteotomy of the uh, femoral epicondyle and then advancing it? What is your take for advancing a proximization of the medial, uh, uh, medial epicondyle and then put in a smaller uh, spacer? Or we are doing a, the lateral epicondyle osteotomy and put in a bigger spacer? Yes, By definitely uh, proximalization of the medial uh, epicondyle is also a described technique. Yeah. I personally have uh, uh, seen two failures, so I have not attempted that, but uh, there is a surgeon from a uh, neighboring state who has done uh, more than 30 cases of uh, proximal advancement on the medial side. So definitely it can be done, but I have seen failures because always the knee is in uh, loading in valgus and this uh, fragment is in distraction. So the bone quality is good. Definitely we can proximalize and fix it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Manoj, uh, what is your opinion on this yeah. uh, about the about the medial epicondylar osteotomy and tightening medial structures? So I think uh, my decision would be very, very clear and a message across to all youngsters. If you have to do an osteotomy, prefer a downsliding lateral condylar osteotomy and just refrain yourself from a medial upsliding osteotomy. It looks simple, but medial upsliding osteotomy is a very, very tough part. MCL is the only structure you have on the medial side. If at all you do something wrong, the only choice will be a hinge. So if you have to correct on rather than, you know, um, sh shortening or imbricating this MCL, work only on the lateral side. Uh, Manoj, I think you have explained very well that the uh, medial collateral ligament is a far more bigger risk uh, uh, to deal with in the middle epicondylar osteotomy. As much as possible, one should restrain himself to the lateral epicondylar osteotomy. And also, one more point I like to mention here, then I will go to Manal for his opinion, uh, that uh, should you do Dhana the uh, epicondylar osteotomy uh, before the release, the lateral release, or would you decide uh, uh, after the release is done and you are not having the adequate opening up on the lateral structures, then you will decide the lateral epicondyl osteotomy. So the osteotomy is done only after the uh, release of the IT band and the capsule. So right. if I'm not able to correct it, then I choose the osteotomy. Second thing I looked to answer uh, Dr. Uttam's previous question. So we had uh, two cases. One was uh, medial uh, uh, proximalization technique was done. It failed. It has to be revised. Uh, second case, it was a very well fixed implant and the surgeon from uh, UK did the live surgery in Ganga operative course. He did a medial reconstruction of the MCL with the semitendinosis. That also failed. So medial soft tissue reconstruction is not easy. Then again, proximalization does also does not work. So lateral sliding osteotomy is okay, but this also cannot be done beyond the uh, few millimeters of lateralization because your deciding factor is the distance between the lateral uh, collateral ligament attachment and the distal, of, distal part of the femoral implant. So if you have to slide more than this, then you have to go for a hinge. So when you're using a hinge, automatically you are uh, reducing the uh, uh, extension gap. You are doing a reduction osteotomy. You're not abnormally lengthening the lateral side so that your common peroneal nerve Palsy does not happen. So, within the limits of uh, uh, soft tissue release and the sliding osteotomy, there can be a good balancing done without a risk of common perennial pal nerve palsy. If the extensive deformity, better to straight away go for a hinge with intraarticular shortening so that you don't lengthen and cause common perennial nerve palsy. That's an important point uh, that if you have a, yes, Abhay, uh, if you have a, a 
MCL ineffic inefficient MCL, then instead of trying only the osteotomy, you have to be ready with the hinge implant. I think that's a very important point. Abhay, would you like to say something on this? Yeah, so uh, I think a very important take home to understand here is that the purpose of the lateral epicondylar osteotomy will not be to perfectly give you a, a, a correction of the trapezoidal extension space. So it is basically to balance where your knee is, is already looking balanced, but still the medial side is opening more than the lateral side. And there is where uh, you've done all the releases and you just need to distalize uh, the lateral epicondylar, uh, the LCL and the and you do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy and you balance the whole thing. But if you have still have a trapezoidal space, now that lateral epicondylar osteotomy is not going to do any correction for you there. So you need to balance your knee in extension and uh, after getting your balanced knee, if you still have uh, uh, an imbalance of the uh, medial and lateral space or you're not getting isometricity of the two collateral ligaments, that's when you probably decide to do the lateral epicondylar osteotomy. Uh, very right. Uh, uh, the take-home is that if you have an MCL deficient knee, then there is no point of trying all these uh, osteotomies or too much of soft tissue release uh, plan for the uh, constraint implant rotating hinge kind of a implant. Uh, Mrinal, uh, you have any final comments? No. So I think my question was already asked by you, uh, whether to do uh, lateral epicondylar osteotomy initially or do the releases and do, then do it, you know. So I would ask a different question from Dhanashekra, which would be like, what degree of flexion would he like to fix his osteotomy? So that there is no flexion extension mismatch. So hmm. you can answer that. So we will That's a very important subject here. Yeah. So we'll do we'll do osteotomy, put to your trial spacer, and then take the knee to a range of movements. It will allow the osteotomy to slide down. So when it slides down, we mark it in extension. What is the position in extension? Again, we take it in flexion and see where is the uh, fragment sitting. So we can decide where you want to place it. If there is only extension tightness, you slide it down distally. If there is extension and flexion tightness, we slide it distally and posteriorly. In flexion, you see where the fragment is sitting and position that in that uh, same uh, place and then fixed with the screw in flexion. Very difficult to fix with the screw in extension. So always fix it in flexion, temporary screw and make sure it corresponds to the position where it was in extension. So you have an imaginary position both in extension and flexion. You try to reproduce that, but fixation is in flexion only. So have you ever seen any mid-flexion instability in such, uh, you know, once you've balanced it uh, with the temporary positioning? Because once you're doing it in flexion extension, that point moves. Yes. So, but most of the time, we leave it a little bit tight. If you are lengthening too much, then you are going to have a mid-flexion instability. But when you're using an osteotomy, always slightly undercorrect so that the fragment is fixed tight and your lateral collateral ligament is always tight, both in flexion and extension. So that way you don't develop a mid-flexion instability. So should you, um, Rinal, if you are if you are able to sort of uh, temporarily fix it and then fine-tune the fixation where, where you are going to fix uh, after the implantation, the final cementing of the implant, then it becomes probably a very easy thing to manage the uh, the extension gap, flexion gap, and also the mid-flexion gap. Uh, Rajiv, uh, you have some question. Yes, yes, or comment? Yeah. yeah. No, I just wanted to ask a question. Because Manoj, that, you'll, we'll come to you after Rajiv. Yeah. Dr. Abhay has shown that there is a case with a severe valgus and uh, flexion deformity. So I just want a tip how to prevent, uh, because uh, CP and palsy would be more common in such cases, in fixed flexion and valgus deformity. So how, any, any tips and tricks to prevent those? Because I have not done that, those complex cases. So, Dhan, Dhan Shekhar or Manoj. Uh, or, or Dr. Or Abhay, like yeah. yeah. yes. So, uh, flexion deformity is basically require a posterior clearance. Normally, you have osteophytes tilting the PCL. Once you do that posterior clearance, the majority of these FSDs do resolve. Only in a very complex valgoid with flexion, there you have fear on these cases of a CPN palsy. So, there yeah. are the cases where you would leave your knee in a bit amount of a flexion on pillows and gradually keep stretching over time. But that's only in very severe cases. Normally, for majority, the moment you sort of do a posterior clearance on the lateral side, that will get rid of your flexion deformities. Okay. And, and my experience, Manoj, that if we do, if we avoid stretching the, the, the deformity against the deformity, probably that is uh, the best precaution 
that you can take for to avoid the common prevalent nerve palsy. Yeah. Uh, uh, because the stretching uh, injury is the worst injury. Uh, then, Shekhar, you have any comment on this? Sir, uh, mild flexion deformity can be corrected the way Dr. Manoj has explained. Do a posterior capsule release, it will automatically get corrected. And severe flexion with severe valgus, we have started doing uh, common peroneal nerve release through a lateral, lateral posterolateral incision. We have done four cases like that and uh, we are able to release the nerve and uh, reduce the tension. That avoids the common peroneal nerve palsy. Okay. So one quick take is that uh, once you've done your posterolateral capsule, that's what's going to be the posterolateral corner that's going to be tight. So once you've done the posterolateral capsule and the posterior capsule, the next step is probably the IT band. And if after that it is still tight, then probably it just opens up the door to either do a, a, a clearance of the common peroneal nerve at the head of the fibula, or sometimes even you can resect the head of the fibula. And, uh, and avoid. But as Dr. Rajiv said, that if you have to stretch to maintain correction, it's better to leave them in slight flexion and stretch them over time. Right. Uh, Vijay, are you there? Pankaj? So, if, you, if you have any, any comments, Pankaj or Vijay, and then after Manuj. Yes, Manuj, I think they are, they are just joining. Yeah. Please. So, so uh, Rajiv, my, this question goes back to Dharasekhar and you, specifically on your experience back to when we talk about a complex varus knee, so today the talk is let's go in for a kinematic alignment, leaving the knee three degrees of varus rather than doing an osteotomy. Now, vice versa, Dhanashekar, that you have a knee which is trapezoidal, you have two choices to move through. One is doing a lateral epicondylar osteotomy and second is putting your femur in some amount of an internal rotation where you can still cheat around to balance your patellofemoral dynamics. In which case you would prefer a few degrees of internal rotation and where you would prefer an osteotomy? So, if it's a uh, slight valgus, less than 10 degree of surgical valgus, mm -hmm. I'll do these two uh, described techniques. You can slightly put the tibia in valgus or the femur in slight rotation. So, surgical valgus, less than 10 degrees, which can be corrected only by soft tissue release or with some bony correction. So, these are the uh, indications for uh, a slightly under correction on changing the component rotation. So, when the surgical valgus is less than 10 degrees, I always do this technique. I routinely uh, practice what you are describing. Mm -hmm. So, we'll describe technique to avoid the uh, unnecessary soft tissue release and minimal change in component does not affect uh, long term outcome. So, uh, I think I would have uh, a uh, very right. Uh, very right. Uh, Manoj, what I prefer is that if you leave some amount of valgus deformity up to three to four degrees, I think it is better to leave in some amount of valgus because this patient has been in this significant valgus deformity for many years. That is one thing. And also leaving at three to four degrees of valgus uh, will also reduce the amount of the release as Dan Shekhar has, has just explained. And I think that is a very, very right way. Rajiv, in our practice, but, uh, when we but, find uh, Please uh, don't leave this uh, obese patients, especially short uh, Indian females who have got obese thighs in valgus because they will not be happy to have a valgoid knee after the surgery because the thighs will rub against each other while walking. So that is why in short obese females, uh, it is preferable that you achieve a good correction or live neutral rather than leaving a valgus in short uh, Indian females. Uh, right, Shubran, true. And also one uh, last thing that uh, many of these patients may have the recurvitum along with. So yeah. One has to be careful and ensure that you you uh, you observe it very well on the table. If there is a recurvatum deformity, ensure that this is corrected well. Because leaving the valgus and recurvatum both will be very bad and especially in the obese patient. I think very right. Yes. Manuj, what, uh, what do usually, you do? Usually rheumatoids are, uh, you know, flexion deformity yeah. with valgus and osteoarthritis are recurvatum with uh, valgus deformity. Hmm. I, I think very right. Um, uh, and minute. I think uh, any, any last comment from the faculty and then we'll move on to the case presentation. No, Dr. Rajiv, we'll ask Manuj his opinion. He raised the question. What is yeah, please, opinion? please, Manuj. Yeah. In my cases, whenever I find that the uh, patient is osteoporotic and I have huge chances of failure of my fixation, those are the cases in which I would prefer to go in for a bit of an interpretation and not take a risk of losing my osteotomy fixation. In all other cases where I have a good bone stock, decent bone stock, and I know that my osteotomy is going to hold well with screws, that's the place where I prefer a lateral condylar osteotomy. And we have to be clear that under correction is like 2 or 3 degrees, not yeah. more than...
not more than that of course uh, i i i agree with this and dr so rajesh we close the discussion yeah yeah danshikar please you know the excellent case of uh, extra articular over corrected valgus well corrected with osteotomy congratulations on that very nicely done hmm. uh, is i i think in these cases it is better to accept and plan beforehand so that you are very sure that you are not doing the unnecessary releases and you are sure that you are going to do the osteotomy thank you so thank you so much danshikar and manuj uh, and abhay yes. uh, and we'll now go on to the we'll close the discussion and we'll go to the case presentation and the in the faculty dr sanjeev uh, is there uh, from jammu uh, mrinal and our all faculty please participate uh, dr rajiv are, are you going to share your screen yeah please Mm. Today we have a uh, small issue with the with yeah. the IT. It seems I can't uh, share it. I don't know. There is some problem. I think we'll have to do a, a trial uh, sh- sharing of the screen with before uh, IOA TV and Ortho TV. <laughs> maybe maybe that is too much of. Uh, Start to show. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, software glitches are there. Can you see my screen? No. Uh, no, we don't see at the moment. Mm. Okay. Uh, Nirmal, please re- be ready with the uh, yeah, for the next yes, case. Then present here. Uh, Nirmal, can uh, if you are ready, can you please come? Uh, okay, Manal. Uh, finally, we'll we'll have to request you. Both are not here. I'll wait, I'll sit with Dr. Ashok, a sham of Ortho TV, and try to sort it out for the next time. We can see screen, uh, Manal. Look at full screen, Manal. Go to the slide show, right? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, fine. So I'll be presenting a case which would be probably a cakewalk for stalwarts, but a learning message for youngsters. Uh, this is a sixty-six year female. Actually, uh, she came to me in two thousand sixteen with bilateral knee pain, and she was rheumatoid. and she had this wim sweat deformity and i advised her total knee replacement uh, which she did not agree to and uh, almost 6 years down the line she came to me uh, it's not moving yes okay now so this is how she came to me suddenly the attendant said that she stopped uh, walking and uh, she came on a wheelchair to me and this is what she had so you can see that she's developed a stress fracture in the upper uh, one third of the tibia junction of upper one third and lower two third she you can see the skin condition also this is how she was when she came uh, she had previous surgeries during the childhood we don't know the details there is some uh, bone formation also between the tibia and fibula and there is a scar mark uh, puckered scar mark which is actually adherent to the bone Uh, so obviously this was a little tough situation for me um, because i could not assess rather my resident who evaluated her also got the stress fuse done thinking that probably this was a very lax knee and you know th- that's why we have those varus valgus fuse here uh, so the plan was how to expose because there was previous surgical marks what cuts to be taken what are the releases i would need and what kind of implant would be needed because i also have a fracture down there Yeah, okay, ultimately, so before you before you go ahead, Manal, can we yeah, go back? Yeah. Can we go back to the? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So in this, uh, in the presence of the lateral surgical scar, previous surgical scar, um, uh, can we ask the faculty that what is this? What is the approach that they will prefer? Uh, Manoj, would you still take up the uh, the uh, medial parapetalar approach in this case, or you will prefer a uh, lateral approach? I think he has left. Another doctor. 
धन शेखर वट वुड यू वट वुड बी योर प्रेफरेंस शुभ्रंशु Yeah, I will see whether the scar is matured or not. If you can pinch the skin and lift the skin away from the subcutaneous tissues, that means the scar is matured and unlikely that you will develop skin problems. But if the scar is uh, not matured, then we can go for a uh, through the same approach. But if the matured scar, I will still prefer a anterior midline. Yeah. That's that's a very important yeah. take home message, Subrancho, that you have given. Is that if the scar is adhered. then it is better not to touch it right uh, if you have to go for the medial yeah vijay uh, good that you are yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah so, so so one of the main you know here i think you should also have an opinion on okay? and i think i would go by the lateral most by the lat i normally do a medial parapetal but here the scar looks looks quite lateral and i think it would be difficult to go from the medial side so you know there chance of skin necrosis so i would maybe err on the side of a lateral sided scar uh, lateral sided incision with a lateral lateral parapetal approach in this case that, that brings us to a very interesting point vijay that uh, yeah. when you take a lateral approach in this case would you just take the lateral approach soft tissue procedure or would you also add it with the tibial tubercle osteotomy Because I believe that this patient is having a stiff knee as well. Difficult. Yeah, yeah. If the exposure is difficult, then I would have a very low threshold to do a TTO. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and for the for the younger colleagues, if you go for the the middle parapetalar incision, then you will ensure that the incision is have the two incisions, the previous one and the one that you are going to make. You should have at least four to five finger finger distance between the two incisions. So that the wound healing is not a problem. Um, uh, we we go ahead, Mrinal. Yeah. So so you raised a very valid point, Doctor Raji. This patient also has a patella baha, and actually a tibial tubercle osteotomy would do wonders in this case, uh, because you will be able to also you know uh, bring the patella up. So right. this is uh, what I did, and you can see there is a hypertrophied medial uh, side of the quadriceps. Uh, you know the muscle and the tendon is uh, skewed up. You see. So I followed the lateral most incision and got got it down towards the medial side, just above that scar. So the hypertrophied uh, VMO or the medial quadriceps was actually excised, uh, means the joint was opened through that skewed scar. And then I went inside, and this is you see the high kind of osteophytes which were there, which were actually I couldn't find them on the X-rays itself, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. they were pretty hypertrophied, and the, the, there is a obviously a defect in the tibia. You can see. And there is the uh, hypoplastic lateral femoral tendon. The typical things which which we see in a valgus knee, apart from a patella baha. So there were a lot of uh, you know I could uh, understand there could be skin problems, there could be bony defects, there could be a need of a long stem. So all these were planned. And I went in. I did a three degree valgus cut. Did the distal femur first, and you know hardly any bone was cut from the lateral femoral tendon as is usually seen. Now I so, want. I had so, asked. Hey, so here, Munal, before yeah. you go ahead, can I ask the faculty that how many of you take the three degree valgus in a sort of five degree in all the uh, the valgus knees, uh, Shubhranchu? I I always take uh, three degree valgus cut in a valgus knee. Yeah, and, uh, and, and Nirmal, what is your your take in these cases? I always take a three degree. You know. Three degrees. Vijay, you also uh, any uh, yeah, always, any different? Always, always three degrees. But I would do my tibia first. No, I will not do the femur first. Yeah. Uh, and also related question: Where will be your entry point? Will it be the same as we normally make, or you would you, would you medialize or lateralize this no, no, entry no, point? Yeah. So you know, normally you you have a scanogram and it is quite medial to where you normally do for a you know, because right. the straight line is quite medial to the. with the normal shubhranchu you agree yeah uh, normally i plan my uh, x-rays beforehand so i right. put the axis to draw the anatomical axis of the femur and uh, wherever it comes out usually in valgar knee the distal femur is little valgar and hence uh, the entry point is little medial couple right. of millimeters right. medial to the you know very right uh, uh, pankaj are, are you there uh, pankaj valecha Yes, uh, if we go ahead, man. Yeah, you are there. Okay, Pankaj, do you take anything different in these cases where you have a valgus knee and uh, uh, you will take up the normal five degree valgus uh, or, or and, and the entry point as we normally make, or you will change the position of the two? No, sir. I fully agree with the comments already made. 
medial yeah. entry and uh, 3 degree of uh, very, very very right very right uh, mrinal please go ahead it's a very interesting yeah. case so so i had asked for intramedullary uh, cutting jig for the tibia which was not sent uh, so the only option i was left with is either to open it up and put in a small plate and reduce the fracture and then go with my tibial cutting jig extra medullary jig the other option which you know i devised on table was that i used a, a distal femoral you know entry uh, drill which we have for the tibia and i put in the extra medullary rod through that into the tibial shaft so that reduced my fracture and then i could put in an extra medullary jig and after that i removed that jig and i could do my proximal tibial cut so this was an innovation which i made on table because i did not have i did not want to put in a plate and reduce the fracture especially when it was a acute fracture it would have easily reduced and i checked uh, during the uh, on table with the c arm that i am reaming in the correct direction and i plan to put in a you know a snug fitting tibial stem and i did all the lateral releases as have been proposed in the previous uh, you know uh, by the speakers and ultimately it was so stiff in the valgus that i even had to release the popliteus so uh, 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 manal here i'll just make one small comment here if you go, if you go back to the earlier slide yeah. uh, the when you make it tibial cut and tibial cut is always a problem in these cases where you already have a deformity extra articular deformity or a fracture so one one easy method could be that you make the femur first in these cases in instead of tibia first and then keep the tibial cut parallel to the ap cut of the femur if that is uh, possible uh, it will it will save you a lot of issues of uh, initially fixing it up uh, uh, with, with the with the rod as you have done yeah like very actually, very good method you have i have actually yeah. done the distal femur cut first but i could hardly cut right. anything from the lateral femoral condyle so i couldn't have that judgment on table and moreover the fracture was acute so it was very mobile so very i thought right. better to stabilize it and then go ahead with this and uh, it did the job for me and uh, this is the final alignment i could get on table in flexion and extension you can see and these were the final x rays immediate post op and almost 3 4 months post op and this is the scar which so, is so you good. just mentioned that you had to release the popliteus as well yes yeah th th that is a, a interesting point uh, shubhranshu what, what what is your opinion about the release of the popliteus uh, i would rather uh, you know don't touch the popliteus in a valgus knee uh because valve that is the only stabilizer on the because it side. is a stabilizer so, right yeah right yeah. that's ah, a very so very, 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 very good point using the posterior yeah. lateral capsule it band etc but uh, popliteus i don't touch uh, in a valgus uh, vijay what is your opinion pankaj so generally yeah. i would avo avoid uh, i also don't want to do you know Uh, with your voice is breaking yes uh pankaj what you were saying something i guess i was saying uh, i would generally avoid uh, touching popliteus and lateral collateral ligament until unless there is no, nothing else left for me uh, so that's my usual approach but yeah case to case basis i mean i don't know what dr minal felt during the surgery if he felt that there is nothing else which can be done except releasing popliteus is it so Yeah, yeah, because so, this was a very deformed case, Manal, I, I believe, and yes, uh, yes. in this uh, uh, extreme situations, I think uh, release is okay. So in this first picture, you can see that the medial side, uh, lateral side, is very tight. Even after all the releases I have done, the only option why, with me was to either do a sliding epicondyle osteotomy, or you know go ahead and try and do the pop, release the popliteus first, and then you know try and balance it. Release so of popliteus. What was the itself, final? so the release yeah. of popliteus itself opens the joint up to 8 to 10 mm on in, right. uh, in you know once it's very tight then uh, this is the option which is left or you can go ahead with this sliding condyle osteotomy which will bring obviously the popliteus down also right so this is uh, mrinal uh, yeah. at this fracture site did you use the bone graft also because you had the ready bone graft with you no i did not open the fracture side it was a very acute okay. fracture just 3 2 days ago uh, that fracture right. had developed right. and you can right. see it is already healing well i put it her on terry parotide she was rheumatoid yes. she was osteoporotic that's why she sustained this stress fracture and she was walking on it just before 2 days before right and just for the for the younger colleagues that the when you put this is very well fixed uh, uh, thick stem but uh, be careful that uh, this kind of patients can have a another fracture 
uh, in the post operative phase so one has to be careful for that thank so you so much madam sir the learning points are there uh, for the youngsters so osteoporosis needs to be taken care of uh, these severe deformities have stress fractures we can use intermediately tipic uh, tibial cutting jigs and temporarily flip fix the fracture with a small plate and you can use stem extenders to bypass the defect and fluted stems with a hybrid fixation should be used there is a beautiful classification given by dr mullaji published in 2010 which uh, tells you how to deal with acute united and malunited stress fractures with the intra uh, with the intraarticular extraarticular deformities and uh, there is a beautiful chapter written by dhan shekra in my book a knee arthroplasty which deals with the total knee arthroplasty with stress fractures so youngsters should read that chapter thank you uh, thank, you. Th- thank you so much manal i think it's a very uh, uh, good learning case uh, for all of us uh, N- nirmal are, are you ready with your with your case now uh, can you yeah. please share your screen Do- then Dr. i'll request uh, rajiv to be ready just just, uh, just i was just want to one question to dr mirnal can i try yeah. sharing yeah, dr yeah, mirnal please do it yeah Hmm? Continue, continue. Yes, Dr. Uttam. In the meantime, Rinal, you can ask the you can answer the question of Uttam. Yes, Dr. In this case, you have just already released this uh, popliteus tendon. So, which implant you have chose? Mala, you know, semi constant or unconstant or something like PS or PS CR, what, whatever. Well, I could, I could after release, I could balance the knee. So, I did not need to oh, use any constant. Yes, I used simple PFC Sigma with the stem extension. That's it. and it was totally balanced you can see on table all so right the, the other so issue is that you, all all okay. these ca- cases which are the stiff knees uh, they 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 are not so unstable uh, when you when you are uh, releasing the soft tissues so that uh, that scarring itself provide probably some kind of a stability yes uh, and neeraj uh, are you sharing your screen please another thing that uh, if you're not opening the fracture side okay yeah if you're not opening the fracture side the reaming itself i you know provides the graft there at the fracture side when you ream it the ream you know ream the cancellous bone there is the site and uh, because you have not opened the fracture site so that provides you uh, know uh, additionally the uh, bone graft well, to the very right side. and now dr nirmal jajodia from durgapur will be presenting his case of lateral epicondylar osteotomy uh, nirmal please yeah thank you sir uh, is everybody able to see and hear me yes sir we can yeah we can so i'm presenting a case of a 54 year old lady who presented with bilateral knee pain and deformity the right knee was more painful and deformed uh, there was a valgus deformity of 30 degree and it was not correctable at all with the right knee uh, with a laxity of the mcl and it was a, a grade 2 deformity by the classification that we go because there was no tibial uh, uh, osteotomy or tibial defect the range of motion was a 5 degree hyperextension to a 110 degrees of flexion now we know the classification is gone through that so, so won't to be delving more into that now this was the uh, the uh, pre operative x ray of the patient where we have about 25 to 30 degree of valgus and this is a stiff valgus uh, there is no correction on varistress and as you can see on the lateral uh, x ray also that there is a lot of uh, hypoplasia of the lateral condyle so just to uh, refresh uh, the structures which are tight in extension uh, we know that the it band and the posterolateral corner uh, of the capsule when it is tight in flexion it is the contribution from the popliteus and when it's tight both in flexion and extension we have the lateral collateral and epicondylar osteotomy is one of the uh, uh, procedures of choice however there is a high rate of instability in the paper by ranawat uh, where they say 24% uh, uh, instability if you uh, choose this as a procedure of the release of the lateral collateral ligament rather than the epicondylar osteotomy so the bony release of the epicondylar osteotomy becomes the procedure of choice if you have a knee which is tight both in flexion and extension now uh, to make you understand what happens when we do a Uh, epicondylar osteotomy is an interesting chapter in the book uh, of the arthroplasty uh, that is the axis of rotation of the tibia on the femoral uh, condyles in the valgus knee now in a situation where the tibia is not deformed the first distal femoral cut where the femoral is placed which is perpendicular to the uh, mechanical axis 
distalizes the axis of rotation in extension, but doesn't do anything for the axis of rotation in flexion. Hence, you will always have a situation where uh, you would require to uh, ligament balance to balance the collateral ligaments, do something like an epicondylar osteotomy, which distalizes the axis both in the range of flexion and extension, like uh, we were discussing in about, you know, that isometric point of fixation. So, this procedure is helpful when you have a severe deformity in the distal femur and no deformity in the tibia. However, uh, be aware if you choose this procedure for the type C types, the type 3 of Krakos. Because when you choose this procedure for the type 3 where there is a tibial deformity, what you are doing is you are distalizing and then you are altering the rotation axis in flexion and in extension. So, uh, instead of choosing an epicondylar osteotomy to balance the type 3 deformities, you should be choosing probably a corrective osteotomy as was shown in one of the you know previous cases by Dr. Rajiv Sarma. Now, we chose to uh, have in mind that we might require an epicondylar osteotomy in this case because it was a rigid valgus. And how is it done? You get a 3 or 4 millimeter, 5 millimeter slide. You do a distal femoral uh, after your distal femoral and your uh, cuts, your fine finishing cuts are cut there and you maintain a part of the uh, anterior femur and you do a transverse cut and then osteotomize, use your osteotomy to complete and leave the periosteum attached to the epicondyle, uh, to the to the fragment. Uh, after you've done that and you've distalized, you fix it and then you shave off the extra bone that might be coming into the way. Now, this is the video of the procedure that this patient required. We did a uh, iliotibial band and a postrolateral corner release in extension, but the knee was still not balanced. At this point, we wanted to assess uh, what is the residual uh, component of uh, deformity by the, uh, the collateral ligament and the popliteus. And when we did the component internal rotation and we uh, chose uh, the gap balancing method, we were still having a lot amount of tightness. And, and we decided that the structure which was contributing was the uh, collateral in the IT uh, collateral in the uh, popliteus because there was a tightness both in flexion and in extension and at that stage in the surgery we decided to go out with a epicondylar osteotomy so we have marked uh, the medial most margin of the osteotomy we won't go medial to that because we'll end up into the shaft with KOS and then that is the osteotomy being done so after you've done the uh, distal cut you take an osteotome flip it open, it's like a green stick fracture that you create you and then you uh, take some soft tissue and periosteal sleeve left with it. So complete the cut and then flip it back so it still remains slightly attached so that it slides along with this tissue sleeve. And once you have done that, the biggest challenge is to find out what is the isometric point of fixation of this fragment. So uh, after you done then you implant your trial components and then you give your shortest insert which the medial side is accepting and that will gradually stretch the ligaments down, the fragment down distally and posterior. Now here it has gone more posterior than distal. So as we put the uh, trial spacer, we, it still doesn't go in easily. We have to do a bit of struggle and gradually releasing the periosteal attachment and letting it slide further and further posterior and we would be able to get the insert in. And, and, and a good balance at that stage. And that is your point of provisional fixation after you run the knee through a range of motion and find out the point where it lies the best. So after we have inserted with a... Uh, uh, yes, that is where the insert starts going in and you get a knee which is in completely balanced in flexion and extension and complete, uh, well aligned mechanically. And that is the point you decide the point of fixation of the lateral epicondyle. So, this is the post-op x-ray where we can see that the fragment has slid slightly distally and more significantly posteriorly. The extra amount of bone has been trimmed and we could still manage with a primary cruciate retaining knee without any constraint and a well-balanced knee with a good function. So, that was the deformity, that is the balance and that is the post-operative walking video at three months of the patient. The, right, the left knee is still due for another surgery, uh, for a surgery. The right knee is completely balanced. There is no thrust and no instability on walking. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's, the, that's the case. I'll be open for any questions, sir. Uh, th thank you, Nirmal, for a very lucid uh, 
case presentation. Uh, it was a very good learning point, especially about the epicondylar osteotomy. Uh, for for uh, beginners, uh, I'll point out again here that the in very osteoporotic bones, one must avoid doing the epicondylar osteotomy uh, because the fragment will be very, very much shattered, will not be able to hold very well with the screws. And if it is done, Dr. Nirmal has shown very well that it can, once you do the osteotomy, it can, it can decide itself uh, how much posteriorly it has to shift or distally it has to shift. Uh, uh, that, that, is, that was your message, Nirmal, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, right, any, com any comment, uh, Pankaj or Vijay? Uh, Bro, uh, excellent case, Dr. Rajiv. Yeah, excellent case, Dr. Rajiv. I think, you know, the stiff valgus. Especially the stiff valgus, you should know osteotomy and as rightly pointed out, you know, you should be careful in rheumatoid osteoporotic patients. Very, very careful if you, you know. Yeah. Yes, and I agree that uh, uh, Nirmal, well, that you, you have decided beforehand that this patient will need an epicondylar mm -hmm. osteotomy and I think that is a very right, uh, right approach. And instead of trying to release the lateral collateral ligament uh, almost completely and then after uh, going to the epicondylar osteotomy. Um, Manal, you because, have any, any point in this? Sir, I think uh, I totally agree with you. For the medial side, uh, we can do the releases and then go for the medial condylar sliding osteotomy. But if there is a fixed valgus, you should initially, if you decide that you have, you would do, you would need probably maybe a valgus of 20, 30 degrees, which is fixed. You will need a sliding condylar osteotomy. Go straight away with that. That is going to make a life pretty easy. From the right. uh, can I request Dr. Rajiv to sort of uh, start share your screen yeah, so that uh, uh, will you be able to show your case? Yeah. Can you uh, screen? Right. Uh, yeah, put it on the slideshow, please. Yeah. There's a question in the chat box that what is your post-operative protocol? Do you change uh, after doing a lateral epicondylar osteotomy? Uh, Nirmal, uh, would you like Nirmal, to answer? Nirmal, what is yeah. Yeah, Nirmal, what so is there is there is no change in the protocol. The fragment, uh, because the lateral side is usually sclerotic in the non rheumatoid knees, and you get a good bony uh, fixation, and none of the post operative rehabilitation changes. We just go regularly standing, full weight bearing, and allowing the range of motion from the second post operative day. Uh, but Nirmal, in my cases where I do the epicondylar osteotomy, I give them the knee immobilizer for walking for a period of three weeks as a as an added precaution. I think it's a small precaution. It doesn't harm us in any way. And always the problem happens when the patient is walking in the in extension. Uh, right. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Verma, uh, uh, please uh, start your case. Thank you, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Uttam Garg for uh, letting me present a case. I think after all the difficult cases, I'll finish with a very simple case. Because what Dr. Uttam asked me was to do a, uh, if, if you do a lateral parapetal approach, which obviously I was trained. Uh, uh, but, a, but a very important subject, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, uh, I'll start with the case. So this is a 62 year old, as we have seen until now, a lot of them have got windswept deformities. So the right knee is valgus, but obviously the middle compartment is also destroyed and there are a lot of osteophytes and the left knee is severe varus. Uh, as these patients come to us a bit late, so this is in the OR, I am checking for the, is it correctable? It is, you can see the varus, but the other side is correctable. The valgus is correctable, it's, a, it's a probably a grade one. Uh, Grade 1, according to Ranavad's classification, this is a grade 1 valgus knee, which, is, which we see in almost 80% of the cases. So, I normally use a lera, uh, lateral parapetalar approach, which I was uh, trained while working in UK. And we had a lot of uh, Asian patients in Bradford where our consultants used to do a lateral parapetalar approach. So, I normally take around 3 to 4 finger breaths above the patella and up to the tibial tuberosity distally. But we can increase the incision as we like, or if the deformity is severe, we can increase it. So, what the literature tells us and what uh, as our, uh, we have discussed now, once we do the lateral parapetalar approach, we actually deal with the deformities itself during our approach and the uh, approach to the joint. So we make an incision releasing the lateral retinaculum, which can release a lot of 
deformity. And after that, if you see that I have already removed the osteophytes, which is an important part for any varus knee or a valgus knee from the femoral condyle as well as tibial plateau. And then we uh, am trying to release iliotibial band from the Gerdes tubercle, which will take care of a lot of our valgus problem in definitely in 80% of our cases. And then we can release the capsule also, lateral and posterior lateral capsule to correct the deformity. So this is, I'm just showing that uh, because once you have got a severe valgus, valgoid knee, then we have to keep the fat pad infrapetular as well as on the lateral side, which helps in closure. In this case, it wasn't that difficult, but I have seen during my uh, registrar years that uh, sometimes we cannot close it without the help of the fat. So this, uh, this is the uh, intraoperative picture with hypoplastic lateral condyle of femur and eroded lateral tibial plateau. There is obviously a er uh, lot of erosion in the medial side also. So if you see these cuts, uh, as we have already discussed, there will be very little cut on the lateral side. I also use a trans epicondylar axis to check my rotation in these cases because of the hypoplastic uh, lateral condyle. So I mark it with a cautery. This is the tibial cut. I took lateral 2 millimeter just to balance the knee. This is uh, trial implantation. And I also, if you see it carefully, I have also marked the tibial rotation uh, with my trial implantation, which has been told by Dr. Sharma and all our uh, faculty. So this was the closure. Sometimes you find it really difficult if in a severe well-guard knee. So then at this stage, the fat helps. This I can see that there's no patellar mal tracking and I've got a good range of flexion and extension movement. So this is the post of X-ray. I have used a uh, posterior stabilized knee. So this is this was the, just the one case I, I could take the pictures intraoperatively. This I did, just did around three, four days back. These are the old cases which I have done, but I didn't have the intraoperative pictures. This is the right knee is also similarly severe valgoid knee. And obviously in this I have used a constrained implant. This was an international patient, obviously uh, African patient came late. This is a similar case. So I think with a simple lateral parapetular approach, uh, we can get the correction in simple knees. That is 80% of the cases. So this is a video just to show <laughs> that if we enter the correct space, <laughs> <laughs> if we take a correct approach and enter the correct space, we can actually see what we want to see and release what we want to release. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rajiv. I think the last video showed uh, the summary of this whole webinar that you need to know exactly where, where what is the answer for the problem that you are dealing with. Uh, if you don't know the right place uh, where to do the release, uh, there will be a major issue. Nirmal, you have a question to Dr. Rajiv? Uh, Dr. Rajiv, yes, sir. Uh, there, is a, there is a description uh, for the uh, expansion of the lateral uh, arthrotomy by a, by a horizontal Z uh, plastic kind of a thing, the kiblish modification of the lateral approach, uh, so that the soft tissue closer becomes easier. Any experience with that? No, I haven't. I have not done this. I think it's a lateral arthrotomy in coronal plane Z plastic, you mean, right, isn't it? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah, not yeah. used it. Yes, I have not used it. No personal, experience. but yeah, it's been described in the books and it is, uh, I think, described uh, in 1991 by the person who described, I can't remember his name. Dr. Kiblish, I think it's a yeah, Kiblish, yeah, yeah, approach. It's a Kiblish approach where you have to, it is for the very severe valgus deformity. Severe valgus deformity, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, the one thing that I'll point out here, uh, Rajiv, that all yeah. these cases where you take the lateral approach, uh, one has to be ready that these patients may bleed more. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, and in a stiff knee, probably the easy approach is you do it along with the tibial tubercle osteotomy. Yes. Yeah, another very important point in all these valgus knees is that uh, you should be ready. Transepicondylar axis is a very important uh, parameter. 
uh, and if you should be ready to rotate your femur uh, laterally uh, more than uh, normal in, in many of these cases. Yes. So one has to be very careful about it. Yeah. And we have learned very well about the epigondylar osteotomy uh, by various examples given by our all the previous speakers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And if there is any last comment uh, in this webinar, maybe Rajiv, we can stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I'm just trying to stop. Uh, this is my uh, last uh, any last comment from the uh, from the uh, faculty, and then we'll be stopping the live streaming of this uh, this webinar. Sir, uh, Uja, uh, are you uh, yes, please, Uttam? Ante, yeah. Are you there, Uttam Ante? Yeah, Mohan yeah. is there. Yes, yes. So, what is your take in the uh, valgoid knee uh, in the type 1 and type 2? Which approach should be preferred? It should be lateral parapateral or should it be medial? What is my take for young generation? In, in grade 1 and 2? Grade 1 2, it is always medial parapateral. Always, always medial parapateral. Even in grade 3 also, I take medial parapateral approach. The lateral parapetal approach is good to learn as an orthoplasty surgeon, but uh, you know it has its own share of complications also. It is not that uh, great that uh, <clears throat> one uh, has to practice, but uh, most of them, uh, most of the 99.9% .9 of bulgus need, we can correct it through the parapetal approach. Yeah, but, so in my, my opinion, the lateral approach is restricted to those patients where you have a very severe fixed valgus deformity. Uh, where you have a previous scar which is laterally placed uh, and you have to you, have, you need to take up the same scar i think these are the two very important indications Manal, you have a comment on this sir i just want to dis i want you to discuss uh, your salient points uh, for recommendation in a valgus with hyperextension the valgus in, valgus in hyperextension is a very difficult deformity and one has to be one is that one must recognize uh, your, your knee before you start the bony cuts. The one of the very important thing is that you ensure that your your femoral cut, the distal femoral cut is uh, is uh, lesser. Uh, so you cut the less distal femur uh, and ensure that you don't release posteriorly. Uh, and, and in these cases, if you have a slight suspicion, you have to have the constraint implant ready in your uh, in your uh, uh, in your operation theater. Uh, and also with the extension stem, because my feeling is that in the moment the patient is having an unstable knee, uh, st stabilizing it with a, with increasing the constraint within the implant will also mean that there will be more stresses at the at the implant bone su su surface. So these patients should always be used with the extend the extension stem, uh, whether you use a primary knee primary knee implant or a revision knee implant. Abhay, you have a different opinion on this? Sir, I feel uh, the valgus hyperextensions are the ones which will not be tight. So they will always be correctable. The right. issue is to balance them. So I think the key things here is to minimize your cuts, both on the femur and the tibial side. That's mm -hmm. absolutely primary. And once you get a balance, and then it is basically a take on whether you want to do. So in your, even if you're using a primary implant, I would only go up to uh, an extension stem if I feel that because of osteopenia, you know, I want to protect my fixation uh, or, or any other reason. But uh, the valgus hyperextensions correct well. So maybe what we uh, would like all the faculty to 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 express their take home is in cases of the valgus flexion ones, which are the rigid ones and the stiff ones. And those are the ones which even after your correction, sometimes, you know, they will have some corrections left behind. And then what do you do for them? And those are the ones which you probably have a higher risk for a CPN. So right. I would like to add right. on something. Um, right, right. Um, yeah. So if we have an hyperextension, probably the stem would be needed if there's an anterior medial defect and you need to build it up. Because usually you see anterior medial laterally, uh, defect laterally in the tibia. Uh, where you might need uh, some kind of augment or uh, probably a tibia, uh, tibial stem. And also in those which would have probably a neuromuscular element where you might need a constrained implant or a hinge. So those are... And also one very important thing, uh, Mridal, that you must always give the knee immobilizer in about 10 degree flexion for a period of three to four weeks in these cases. Yeah. Because I the posterior capsule... Yeah. 
because the pusher okay. capsule, if it is lax, uh, then it's a, it's a major thing. And if you find that the pusher capsule is lax, which may happen in many of these cases, uh, you you should not you should ensure that you use a constrained implant in these cases. Sure. Yes, uh, uh, Rinal, you one, are saying something. One thought process on these situations is that uh, we need to look at them as revision, uh, as we look at the revision scenario. So when you feel your zone one fixation is not going to be enough, you add fixation. And in, in today's times, we have good enough implants where the keel has a good length for us not to worry too much. So if you're adding uh, a stem, and then you're probably looking at an additional zone two fixation and then you just need to do a hybrid cementation and just cement the proximal part so that you prevent proximal stress shielding as well. You're right. Very important point. Uh, Mrinal, uh, you yes, have sir, any thanks. more point before we close it, to close this webinar? Uh, Shubhanshu? Yes, please. But uh, uh, your last question I would like to yeah. ask. Well, yeah, just, just before that, uh, just uh, in corollary to Abhay's answer, Whenever you are adding stem, you have to be careful about the, your uh, base plate position. Sometimes your stem decides your position of your base plate. So if you are giving a good coverage without a stem, and you put the stem, there is a possibility of little overhanging here and there, depending upon the anatomy of the proximal tibia. Mm -hmm. So that is why, uh, if at all you are using the stem, if there is a chances of alteration of position of the tibial base plate, better to use a short cement stem rather than a long stem on cemented one uh, where there will be diaphyseal fixes. Uh, or in these cases, probably offset stem yes. uh, could, could be an option. Yeah. Uttam, your last question and then we close this webinar. And, and to yourself, <laughs> Dr. Yeah, Rajiv. Please. please. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a valgus near uh, deformity about 20 to 25 degree, an extra articular deformity. What is your opinion regarding correction? Will you like to prefer correctly the intra-articulary or will we go for the supracondylar osteotomy? Uh, the, the sequence is in these cases. Uh, first, the identification whether the deformity is in the femur, which is most likely, I'm or the tibia. And yeah. when, you, when you are sure that you have a deformity in the femur, you do the release uh, and the release is not going to, not enough to control the deformity. Uh, to, to correct the, uh, the uh, valgus deformity. In these cases, go for the metaphyseal osteotomy. And metaphyseal osteotomy, supracondylar osteotomy, is a very easy method, unlike what we probably uh, may, may fear about. Be careful in doing this osteotomy. Use the extension stem and, and, and keep the opposite part of the bone, uh, periosteum, intact. So once you keep the opposite periosteum intact, the osteotomy remains uh, significantly stable. And then using the stem uh, and uh, fixing the implantation is very easy. Yeah, and, and you can use the staple, uh, one or two staples uh, for to fix it temporarily uh, on the table. And then after you may leave the staples there or you may, may just remove. Dr. Mendal? Yes. What do you what do you suggest? Any opinion? I think what Dr. Rajiv is saying is uh, perfectly fine. Uh, if you have an extra article deformity going by the Wang's principle, if it's not cutting onto the uh, if it's cutting into the condyles, then you do enter article correction or you go for extra article. You can do it same stage or you can do it in two stages. That depends upon your right. 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 Very right. right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, I think this was a very, very interesting discussion, very, uh, very interesting uh, presentations of the uh, of the uh, talk also, as well as the very interesting cases. Uh, excellent participation of the faculty. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and Puja, now we'll we'll uh, close this uh, uh, live streaming. Uh, Poonam, Poonam. Poonam, please. Poonam from Ortho TV. Thank you. Uh, can, can we request you to stop the live streaming? Thank you so much all. And uh, we will be coming up with the 